Good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi à tous. So, um, October is for me uh, the most scientifically inspiring month. With the Garner Award tomorrow at the university and the announcement of the Nobel Prize earlier in October, every October I get really inspired by, uh, by all these events. And being here today is equally inspiring. As Christine mentioned, we are here to celebrate Professor Shino Kelly, a scientist, professor, and colleague of remarkable, remarkable accomplishments. For those who might not know, Shana's work is focused on the development of new technology for the fast and accurate diagno diagnosis of infectious disease and cancer. Her lab bridges many diverse disciplines of science, including biomolecular chemistry, cell biology, and nanotechnology. The list of Shana's scientific awards and recognition is long and unparalleled, particularly for someone whose academic career was launched less than 20 years ago. As a scientist, Shana has maintained her success at an incredible pace. She has published over 165 papers with several in the top ranked journals, and her work has been cited more than 13,000 times. As you can imagine, selecting a few of Shana's most impressive achievements to share with you today was not an easy task, but it was an inspiring one. Professor Kelly joined the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences here at the University of Toronto in 2007, along with appointments at the Department of Chemistry, Biochemistry, and the Institute for IBMME, or Institute for Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering. Prior to joining us at U of T, Shana had already been named a top 100 innovator by MIT's 2004 technology review. And shortly after joining us in Toronto from Boston College, she was awarded the prestigious Stacey Prize in 2011, a national prize given annually to one young scientist or engineer in Canada. Last year, Shana was awarded the American Chemical Society's Inorganic Nanoscience Award an honor that recognizes sustained excellence, dedication, and perseverance in research in the area of inorganic nanoscience. These awards, recognitions, and affiliations are important to celebrate, but we must remember the drive and intention behind them. Our previous vice president of research once remarked that Shana's work developing fast, low-cost methods for disease detection and diagnosis will save lives across the world, and I strongly believe that to be true. On a personal side, I have admired Shana's work for several years now. But more recently, we have started to work more closely and collaborate on some very exciting projects. What I find very impressive about Shana is her ability to come into new fields of research, my field of research, and really understand the big problems and the right questions to ask. Another impressive trait is her ability to get the resources needed and always recruit impressive trainees and her relentless pursuit to seek answers to the questions she is asking. Your lab team also praises your example and leadership and have described how committed you are to helping them succeed and launch their own careers in research. One team member even said that in the four years you have worked together, he has never seen you angry. <laughs> and, and that's hard, he said, because we do make mistakes. <laughs> Shana, we know you could be anywhere in the world, and we are so proud that you have chosen the University of Toronto and Farmside to be your own. On behalf of our faculty, allow me to say thank you, congratulations, and please, uh, we're going to look forward to give, you, to give us a summary of your research. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And um, I'm very glad that Christine told you what being a university professor is, because when I told my parents, they said, what do you mean you're a university professor? <laughs> Haven't you been doing that for about 20 years? And so it was kind of lost on them, uh, the, the great, um, recognition that this is, and, and I certainly appreciate um, the university giving me this, this title, and uh, it's one thing when you know, people kind of outside of your own ecosystem 
give you some type of award and it's wonderful, but when your own colleagues recognize your work, I think there's something particularly special and significant about that. So it's really meant a great deal to me. And so I thought what I would do today is to really try to give you a, a bird's eye view of the work that we do, tell you about some of the projects that our, our trainees are working away on right now. And I know I have a group of people here, some of whom uh, live and breathe science, some of whom maybe took one science class in university and then ran screaming. So I'll try to keep this fairly high level. I'll you know use a little bit of jargon here and there, but hopefully, um, I'm able to convey the, the reasons and the, the rationale for, for our projects and, and the things that we really hope to be able to achieve. And so we work in a variety of areas, but maybe one that is, is one of our, our biggest focuses is on the development of new diagnostic tools. And so in the case of, of tools for, for cancer diagnosis, it's not just diagnosis. I mean, that's kind of the, the tip of the iceberg. We also have to enable clinicians to, to gather really specific information about a patient's cancer. And do they have um, a certain molecular profile on the tumor? What types of therapies would be effective? And so we need tools that are uh, effective at giving us prognostic information, predictive information. We also need new tools for the discovery of new druggable pathways. Right over the last five years or so, we've seen an explosion in new types of, of therapies and, and new therapeutics, and that's because we had the ability to look for new, new pathways and then bring molecules in that would be effective for patients. And then finally, we need tools that will allow us, once uh, new therapies are going into the clinic, that will allow us to figure out whether or not a therapy is working, right? That's the last phase of, of drug development to really get out into the, the clinic and, and see what the efficacy of, of a new molecule may be. So these are some of the grand challenges that we have in terms of new tools for, for cancer. Uh, in infectious disease, it comes back to some of the issues that I just mentioned, really being able to rapidly identify and classify infections so that you can tell the difference between an Ebola infection and things that look similar. We need new tools that will help us limit antibiotic resistance, right? We, there's a variety of, of uh, reasons that antibiotic resistance becomes problematic. But one uh, origin of antibiotic resistance is just overuse in the clinic, right? Somebody presents with a bad cough and some stuffiness, and it's a little hard to tell. Is it bacterial? Is it viral? Well, you know, give the patient antibiotics, see if it clears. But that's how we, we sometimes get the ball rolling with antibiotic resistance. And then, of course, controlling viral epidemics. And this list could go on and on and on. There are many, many unmet needs in this area. So these are kind of the, the clinical motivations for, for what we do. At the molecular level, what this means is that we need to develop new technologies that, for example, allow us to look at a drop of blood and then comb through the molecules that are there, right? And in a drop of blood, you have billions and billions of cells, billions and billions of different protein molecules, DNA molecules. And so how do you sort through that? and let's say find a single cell of, that's a bacterial pathogen or find a single viral particle. How do you do that? How do you find proteins that may tell you about it, a specific disease state? Or how can you find uh, cells that may be in the circulation that are actually coming from a tumor? And so I was really trained as a bioanalytical and biophysical chemist, and, and this is kind of what we do. We, we really like to solve what our, our soul are uh, referred to as needle in a haystack problems, right? So instead of thinking about a drop of blood, let's think about this haystack that it maybe has millions or billions of straws of hay in it, and then we're looking for this one needle, and our needle is, is the molecule that we want to detect that's going to tell us about disease. And it turns out this is a really hard set of, of problems to solve, and it, because that searching process, we can't look at one needle from the haystack at a time, right? That'll take way too long, and so we need powerful new technologies that will enable us to do this. Another part of the challenge relates to where diagnostic, or the diagnostic part of medicine gets practiced. And we've all been in this situation, right? You have a kid with a sore throat, you go to the doctor's office, you really wish that they had some way to tell you on the spot what's, what's going on. Does the kid have, have strep throat? How do we treat it? 
Certainly, uh, you know, if you have the misfortune to have a loved one in an intensive care unit, there's a lot of testing that we would love to do right there, right, so that we can tell on the spot uh, what's going on with somebody who's critically ill. And even in an emergency room where you're trying to triage people and really just try to understand why they're there in the first place, we need better tools. Because right now what we typically do is we take samples, right? A, a, a doctor will swab your throat or you take a, a blood sample. That specimen then has a, a long uh, road ahead of it in terms of actually returning a test result most of the time. And so what happens is the, the sample gets collected, that sample goes to a lab, it actually sits at the lab for a while because all big labs do batch testing, it's just most economical to do it that way. Then the test gets performed, and then that test result has to go back to the doctor. And then the doctor has to find a patient, and then eventually there can be some kind of action taken. But this, adds up, this could be two to seven days later after somebody walked into an ER or a doctor's office and said, there's something wrong with me. And so this is one of the big problems in diagnostic medicine. I mean, we need technology, but we need technology that can be used in these types of, of clinical settings and not necessarily in a clinical lab. This is where most of our testing takes place, right? Our batch samples go off to these testing facilities and then you have these very sophisticated labs, um, big, big pieces of equipment, very, very expensive. And what this uh, boils down to is that less of 5% of diagnostic testing is actually done outside of these labs. And so it's all subject to these big time delays and, and bottlenecks. And so what if we could decentralize diagnostic testing? What if we could develop the ability? I mean, we, we can sequence a human's DNA, right? But we can only do that in a lab tucked away in a big central facility or, or within a, a large hospital complex. So can we start to think about providing tools so that a, a doctor in, in their office can take a sample from a patient, test it on the spot, and then figure out what's going on? So this is one of the grand challenges that we've been trying to address. And honestly, this is a problem we've been working on now for a while. I mean, when, when Stefan said something, 20 years, I think, oh my gosh, that's just, it seems impossible. Um, and, and one of the frustrations is like, but we still haven't done it. You know, we were working very hard on this. We've been making some exciting, exciting progress, which I will tell you about. But I have to tell you that some days it's like, oh, you know, are we ever going to move this, this mountain? And I'm, I'm going to go on a tangent for a minute here, because this is just a little story about something that actually made me feel better. So we were often in Europe this summer, and um, we came across, we were in a cathedral, and we saw this clock. Guys, where was this clock? It was in Strasbourg, right, in the cathedral. And we looked at this clock, and the reason this really hit me over the head is because the person who was telling us about the clock said, in the Middle Ages, if you wanted to know what time it was, you went to a church. And for a second I thought, that's so weird. Why would people go to church to figure out what time it was? That was the only place you had a clock, right? Because the technology was not available to put a clock in everybody's house, to put a clock on everybody's wrist, to put a clock in your computer and your phone and all this stuff. And so the clocks were in the churches. And so if you think about this in terms of, you know, what we did in learning how to tell time, so we've always wanted to keep track of time. It's always seemed like a very important thing to do, right? So back, uh, you know, 1500 BC, the Egyptians had sundials, then they had water clocks. Eventually, in the Middle Ages, we made these mechanical clocks. That took a lot of know-how. That was a huge leap forward. And then finally, we had the coiled spring in 1450. And then the watch didn't come along until 1510 AD. And so going from this huge mechanical clock to something that you could carry in your pocket, you know, 300 years. It took quite a while. And then still, we had to get the pendulum clocks and then eventually electric clocks. And now here we are, I mean, this is how we all tell time now, right? I have a watch on. I only wear a watch so that I know if my phone's ringing, right? I don't wear it to, to tell time. But look at how long this took, right? I mean, end to end, this is like 3,500 years to go from looking at a sundial to having something in your pocket that could tell you what time it is. And so now if we think about the progress in diagnostic medicine, you know, you can see that we're, we're kind of on the cusp of a big, big breakthrough. So we st first started thinking about diagnosing disease. This was the first diagnostic handbook ever made. And you can't really see this, but this is a stone slab <laughs> that they carved information into. This was a Babylonian slab where they started to think about how do you classify you know, people that are sick and the things that are wrong with them. They had no idea you know, what the diseases really meant physiologically, but they started thinking about it. 
And then it was 1200 AD when we first started thinking about looking at people's urine to figure out what was going on. And, and I seriously mean look. Like, look, is it cloudy? Is it yellow? Is it orange? Is it? And then there was also some spelling and tasting, which I won't go into. <laughs> but that was when we first started thinking, like, we've got to look at, you know, people's bodily fluids to figure out what's going on. And then it was 1590 when we finally had the compound microscope, right? That then opens up the microscopic world for us to be able to look at it. And then we didn't have the thermometer until 1592, you know, a critical instrument. Uh, for model, uh, monitoring patients. The stethoscope came along in uh, 1816. 1852 is the first time that we did a blood count. So, you know, what does somebody's blood look like? How many red cells do they have? How many white cells do they have? Because we realized that white cells were an important part of the inflammatory response. And then it was 1941 when we first had a way to diagnose cancer by looking at cells. So people figured out that you could smear a, a cervical sample on a slide, you could stain the cells, and you could figure out whether there were cancer cells there. So this is really the first time we did cellular level cancer diagnosis, 1941, right? Just not that long ago. And then if you think about things like PSA testing, um, which is maybe, you know, kind of come and gone already, but 1979 is when we started that. So we're really, and I could put a lot more stuff on here, right? We have. MRI, we have all kinds of, of diagnostic tools now. And so this timeline would start to get very crowded right around here. Mm -hmm. um, but really what we're working towards is having decentralized rapid diagnostics for early and specific detection of disease. And if you take this example of, of clocks and, and timepieces, right, you can see that there's an acceleration and then a big breakthrough. And we're probably, you know, somewhere here kind of getting ready for the, the breakthrough. At least that's what I tell myself. Because, <laughs> again, there are moments where it seems like everything's moving so slowly. So, again, like back to this idea of, of trying to get testing out of the lab. Many of us that work in this field really feel that that is the first step. We've got to give people tools so that disease can be diagnosed basically anywhere. No shipping samples, no complicated logistics, just, you know, test and treat. So, one huge success story in this area is in the development of the handheld glucose monitor. And you guys are all familiar with these. These are small um, handheld units that diabetics can use to monitor their blood glucose. And they're very inexpensive, right? The companies that, that uh, manufacture these, they give the testing units away, and then they charge diabetics for a test strip, right? And so it's a very good model. But it goes to show that you can make a portable diagnostic device that is practical. And the way that these devices work is that there's an enzyme that gets immobilized on an electrode. It's called glucose oxidase. And so glucose reacts with this enzyme, and it produces an electri electrical signal. And so in using this type of setup, you can take blood glucose, and you can turn it into milliamps of current. And this is a very easy type of measurement to make. You just look at the amount of electricity produced by this reaction, and then quantitate the blood glucose. And so when we got going on this many years ago, we thought, okay, maybe the, the way to go is to follow this type of paradigm, but for other types of molecules. This is an easy one because this enzyme exists in biology, glucose oxidase, so you can just stick it to the electrode and off you go with your electrical current. Most of the other molecules that are so important are not so cooperative. And so you have to come up with clever ways to get this electrical signal to be generated. And so that was one of the first problems that we worked on. And we thought about this in the context of DNA. So can we read a DNA sequence using an electrode? And so we came up with this system where we tethered a piece of DNA to an electrode surface, and then we found a way to generate an electrical current if a complementary strand bound to the one that we had on our electrode. So we figured out how to tie electrical signals to DNA molecules. And so this was one of our first big breakthroughs and then what we had to do was really push the performance of this type of system, and in particular, push the sensitivity, because that needle in a haystack problem that I described to you before, there's, there's just not many needles in the haystack. So you need every needle to give you a big, big signal. And that's what we worked on for a very long time. And our solution is sketched out here. So this is a, an illustration from an article that Scientific American ran on the system that we developed we eventually generated these very large sensors, I mean large on the molecular length scale. These are 100 microns across and 100 microns high. 
And the reason that they really help us with performance is because they have a huge amount of surface area. And so they're really able to collect all the molecules that you might have in a specimen. And they're also, you can see they have these spikes. And the spikes were really important uh, because they, they allowed the collection of molecules to be much more efficient and also helped us generate a lot more signal. And so if we just had a few of those needles in our haystack, we could see it. And just for the materials chemists in the room, this is what these structures actually look like. They're basically piles of nanoscale gold needles. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of one of our sensors. And there was a huge amount of, of blood, sweat, and tears that went into developing these and really finding the right types of, of architectures. And I want to mention that this work was done by Leila Soleimani, who was one of the first students that I had when I moved here. She's now running her own lab at McMaster. I'm incredibly proud of her. And then she worked alongside uh, Zhi Chao Fang, who actually moved here with me from Boston. He was really my hero in terms of making the transition and getting all of our you know, stuff across the border and our science across the border. Um, and so he's someone who, who really I, I owe a tremendous debt to, not only for developing these amazing sensors, but also helping my, my lab through that big transition. And so with the development of this sensing system, we were kind of off to the races. And we did all kinds of, of things with these sensors. And I'll describe to you a few of the things that we've done in the lab recently. But I also want to mention that this is a technology that we've taken really all the way and gotten it packaged up for use in the clinic. We started a company called Exogenic. Uh, the company was able to take our sensor technology, package it within a disposable injection molded cartridge. They developed a desktop analyzer that the cartridge could be used with. And so basically all that had to happen is that a patient would be sampled, the sample went into a tube, tube went in the cartridge, cartridge went into the instrument, the user would hit go, and then 20 minutes later they would get a yes, no, or in the presence or absence of an infectious pathogen. And so the company really took this all the way. So they had the instruments done, they had a 20 minute turnaround time, and you can see that with the simplicity of how this gets used, it doesn't have to be used in a centralized lab. You don't have to be a lab tech to use this. You can be anybody you know, who has enough hand-eye coordination to get this, the sample in the tube and the tube in the cartridge and you're ready to go. Um, it really had sample to answer automation and a nice low cost point. And that's really important because just because you're gonna do testing outside of the lab and it makes a lot of sense, doesn't mean you can charge 10 times as much for that type of testing. And so at Exogenic, uh, we took this really all the way. The company, at its, when it was at its largest, was about 60 employees. We raised a lot of venture capital. We built a, a pilot manufacturing facility right on, on York Street in downtown Toronto. We got to a point, though, where we were really kind of at a, a, a point where the technology really had to be scaled to be successful. Because you have to be able to go from making, let's say, 1,000 of these a month to 10,000, and then 100,000, and then a million. And that became a bit of a challenge for a small startup company that was venture-backed. Um, but this, you know, I could probably give an entire talk just about this story and what it was like to see this technology kind of go from the lab, it's just a research project, to uh, very close to a commercial product. And it was an incredible experience to see what's involved in between. But so then over the years with this same technology, we've done a, a lot of things as proof of concept uh, studies in our laboratories with our trainees. And we've used, I'll describe a few of these studies to you. Um, we think this is a very general solution for a lot of different applications. And so I'll mention some of our most recent studies. Um, one of them is the development of a device for HCV testing. So this was a project that was carried out. The, the lead on this project is Wen Han Lu, who is one of our graduate students. And he built this device. Here's our, our sensor chip right here. He packaged up all of the, the reagents and what was needed to break open bacterial cells or viral particles to enable this to work, kind of sample to answer, right in a little device that, that he fabricated himself. He chose HCV because it's a really uh, important global problem. This is a very widespread viral infection. Over 100 million are affected. Half a million people die per year of HCV. And it's a very important screening indication because it can be, it can be asymptomatic. And so it's important to be able to screen the general population. Um, and if you're able to do a, a diagnostic test that tells you about the genotype of the virus, that's particularly valuable because many of the therapies are really specific for different genotypes. So Wen Han did a heroic job of getting the system up and running again, packaging it all together, and coming out the other end of the project with a functional device. 
Um, Jagada Moy Das has been with me for a number of years. He's now one of our, our research associates. And he took our sensors in a different direction and showed that they had the ability to detect circulating tumor DNA. So this is a new class of markers that we've discovered fairly recently. And basically, this is DNA that comes from a tumor in a patient. So as the tumor is, is growing and interacting with the blood supply, it will release DNA into the circulation. And the thought is that if we can pick up on this source of circulating DNA, then that may give us a way to screen for cancer or at the, the very least monitor patients as their cancer is being treated. And so Jagadamoy did a really heroic job of showing that these sensors could pick up on the very low levels of circulating tumor DNA that you might have in a, a patient sample. Uh, another one of our trainees, uh, Wendy Zhao, who just recently uh, defended her, her PhD, um, she used these sensors for a different type of application that relates to the production of stem cells. So we know that there are many different types now of, of potentially therapeutic stem cells that can be cultured in the lab and then used to, to treat a variety of uh, um, conditions. But uh, growing these in the lab, usually you use a, a culture system like the one that is shown here, and it's very important to be able to monitor the culture as the cells are growing. And so Wendy was able to kind of build out our sensors so that they would tell us about the presence of different proteins in these cultures, with the idea being that that would allow us to then really control the efficiency of stem cell differentiation. And so this was another very neat application of these sensors that, that Wendy was able to demonstrate. Um, another area where we've used this is in transplant medicine. And so Andrew Sage, who was a farm sci student in our, our group who uh, graduated a couple of years ago, worked very closely with a group of transplant surgeons based out of Toronto General. And this group that was led by uh, Shav Kashabji um, had a, a class of molecular markers that they had shown would really uh, very accurately predict the outcome of a lung transplant. And this is incredibly important because we're, uh, donated lungs for transplant are really in short supply. So you have a, a waiting list of people that are, are kind of waiting around, waiting to see if they can get a, a lung to be donated for transplant. We, we get the lungs, they're assessed, and only 15% are actually used for transplant. The rest are discarded, so 85% we don't use. And this is very striking because on that wait list, there's a 30% mortality rate. So there are people on the, the waiting list that just can't get an organ in time to, to save their lives. And so Schaff really believes that we could increase this number significantly if we were able to do molecular tests on the lungs that are donated, and then maybe also try to rehabilitate some of these lungs so that they were suitable for transplant. But you really need a rapid type of method for this molecular assessment because most lung transplants actually happen in the middle of the night. So you end up with the, the donation being made because there was an accident, something happened. These things happen more in the middle of the night than during the day. The labs are closed. You can't send a sample off to be analyzed in the lab. And you have a three hour window between the time that the lung is taken out of the uh, donor and it has to go into the recipient. So a really narrow time window. And so Schaff came to us and said, you know, let's try to put together this system where we can use your sensors to look at our markers. And so Andrew did an amazing job of uh, looking for a small group of markers that we could analyze, developing an algorithm, and then showing with a large bank of archive samples that we really could do this type of, of molecular analysis. So I think this is another exciting area for the application of this technology. And then more recently, um, I wanted to, to mention this collaboration with uh, Keith Pardee, which has been uh, really incredibly fun over the time that, that Keith has joined us here at the Faculty of Pharmacy. And what we're doing here is taking the gene circuits that um, Keith has, has really pioneered as a way to do uh, in vitro detection of different uh, nucleic acid sequences, and we're combining his gene circuits with our electrochemical circuits. And so this is kind of a, a first where we take these bio biological circuits and get them to, to talk to a, a kind of an integrated uh, circuit type format. And so Janice Chen, who's a graduate student in the lab, has been working away on this. Uh, Sarah Smith also was a lead on this project. Sarah just left us to, to go start a faculty position at, at Bucknell. Uh, but this, I, I think, is going in a really uh, exciting direction. And then we also have uh, Xiaolong Yang, who's one of our pharmaceutical sciences uh, PhD students who's developing optimized DNA circuits. And this is another new direction that we're quite excited about. 
And so I've told you about sensors that are, are really good at looking at molecules. So different protein molecules, different DNA sequences. But sometimes you really have to look at an intact cell. So for example, if you're trying to, to look at um, tumor cells in the blood or bacterial cells in the blood, you don't just want to look at for a, mo a molecule that is a marker of that cell, but you actually want to capture the intact cell. And so this uh, type of need is, has kind of taken us in a, a different direction over the last few years. And what we've developed is an approach that allows us to find very rare cells in biological samples using magnetic nanoparticles. And the nano here is very important because what we're trying to do is recognize proteins on the surface of a cell and then load the cells with our magnetic nanoparticles really at a one-to-one -one ratio. So the particles have to be really, really small. And this uh, project was the brainchild of one of our research associates, uh, Reza Mohammadi. Um, and what Reza was able to do was not only come up with this approach of using magnetic nanoparticles, but also developing microfluidic devices that would allow us to trap the cells once the nanoparticles were on their surfaces. And so uh, with this type of system, one of the things that we spent a lot of time on over the last few years uh, is pursuing the idea of liquid biopsy. And the idea here is that right now, the primary way that cancer is diagnosed is through tissue biopsy, right? You take a needle, you insert it into the tumor, you take some of the tissue out, and then it gets stained, and then uh, the tumor gets classified. We know that there are tumor cells in the blood where we could do the same type of analysis, but without the need for the tissue biopsy. And this is, would be a very advantageous type of tool to have because what it means is that you can monitor patients. You can't continually re-biopsy patients. It's just it's not, not good for a patient to, to really go through more than, than one needle biopsy. Um, and so we hope that one day this could actually be a replacement for current uh, methods of, of biopsy. But we have to be able to get these circulating tumor cells out of the blood. And this is really the, the ultimate uh, needle in a haystack problem. And you'll see this right here. So here's one of our uh, raises devices. We're flowing a blood sample through it that has a, just a few circulating tumor cells in it that are magnetically labeled. And so you can see here the, the haystack is all of these blood sample, uh, blood cells, right? There's so many of them. And there's just a few of our cancer cells in this mixture. And so we're putting the sample through a microfluidic device trying to trap the cancer cells using these X-shaped structures. And so once we're done processing the blood sample, you can see there's a little pile of cells right here. Those are our cancer cells that we've trapped out of our, our specimen. And then we can specifically identify them by staining them and, and using fluorescence to visualize the cells and make sure that they really are cancer cells. And this is a system that, you know, Reza came to the lab with an interest in circulating tumor cells. We've got the system up and running. I wasn't sure if it was something that we would stick with long term, but I think this is, is an incredibly powerful tool. And we're doing all kinds of things with this now, and I think it's a really important direction for us. And so we've used this type of tool to study tumor progression in animals. This, these are very important model systems for us to understand um, how tumors um, grow and release cells into the, the bloodstream. One thing that I didn't mention is that these circulating tumor cells are also very important because these are really the seeds of metastasis, right? Metastatic disease is caused by these cells that circulate around in the bloodstream, eventually find a place to colonize a metastatic tumor. And, and this is what kills cancer patients, right? It's not a primary tumor. It's not a breast tumor or a prostate tumor. It's the metastatic disease that eventually arises. And so these cells, if we can study them and really understand their biology, hopefully we can find ways to shut down this, uh, metastasis. So that's why we do quite a bit of work in, in animal models. Adam Mepham, uh, who's a PhD student, did quite a bit of our, our early work on that. Uh, Layla uh, Kermanshaw just uh, finished her PhD fairly recently and has also pioneered some of these studies. And then Sharif Ahmed is another one of our research associates, and he uh, kind of does all things related to animal models for us. He's really uh, quite a, a genius when it comes to getting a new model up and running and then knowing how to work with it to do these types of, of studies. And so we've also gone beyond animal studies, and we've done quite a bit of work in prostate cancer in terms of looking at circulating tumor cells and also predicting response to, to therapy. We've had quite a few people working on, on this part of the effort. 
Uh, Mala Pudini was a PhD student with us who's doing a, a postdoc at Stanford, and she now has a faculty position lined up at, at Waterloo, so she'll be returning to Canada and running her own lab. Uh, Bill is a, a PhD student. Brenda just uh, defended her PhD, and uh, she told me today she just got a very exciting fellowship. She's going to go off to Italy to, to do a postdoc. And then Mahmoud uh, Labib is one of our research associates. Uh, who developed a really neat adaptation of the system where you can actually send nanoparticles into the cell, have them bind to messenger RNAs, and then we can capture these cells out of the blood based on specific sequences. So this is a big, big breakthrough. His paper was on the cover of Nature Chemistry, which was a big deal. And then we have a new startup um, that I think it's actually being incorporated today, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, called Cellular Analytics, where we're going to take this technology and, and hopefully get it out. Uh, so that it can be used by, by other folks. Um, and so then this same technology we're also using for bacterial analysis. So Corrine uh, Nember is one of our PhD students who learned how to use the same type of approach but to um, be able to collect antibiotic resistant bacteria out of samples. And so she developed an assay uh, where she could look at this uh, pathogen called methicillin resistant Staph aureus. This is a really important pathogen to be able to track because it causes quite a few healthcare associated infections. Um, there's over tw uh, 200,000 cases of MRSA in Canada every year. And figuring out whether ha somebody has an MRSA infection is really slow. So it can take two to three days with Corrine's method. It takes four or five hours. And that's a pretty significant improvement that can affect the, the outcome for the patient. Um, in addition, we have other microfluidic tools that we're using um, for stem cell uh, analysis. Uh, Saraf Gomez is a PhD student in the lab who developed a system for looking at retinal stem cells. So these are cells that we can isolate out of the retina, but they're present at a very, very low level. So a different type of haystack here, just all the retinal cells that you would find in a dissected retina. But there are stem cells in, in retinas, they're just quiescent. So we could potentially regenerate the retina if we could catch these cells and then find a way to transplant them and get them to differentiate into the in different uh, types of cells that are very important for retinal function. So Saras made a big breakthrough for us over the last year where he developed a really nice microfluidic system for sorting these cells. I just want to mention, I think I managed to get almost everybody in the group who put their faces up here. I wanted to make sure that I also mentioned um, a few other folks. We have another project where we're using quantum dot conjugates. This is another type of nanomaterial for in vivo and in vitro sensing. Uh, Li Bing Zhang is a postdoc in the group who has done an amazing job with taking this technology forward over the last few years. Uh, he's joined now by uh, Hania, who's a new PhD student in the pharmaceutical sciences program, uh, who's now working with Li Bing. And then we also have a project in the lab focused on intracellular drug delivery. And this is something that we've worked on over the years where we've developed uh, small molecules that will get through the plasma membrane of cells and then localize uh, specifically in the mitochondria of, of mammalian cells. This is a, a really uh, interesting way to look at the uh, chemical biology of intracellular organelles um, and potentially also to, to do uh, drug delivery. So with that, that's all the, the science that I, I wanted to tell you about today. I felt like this was just really a wonderful opportunity to tell you all about what we're doing. Um, I, I thank every single person in the group for all of their amazing efforts. I mean, these guys know, like, you know, they've never seen me angry. I don't believe that for a second. Uh, I'm <laughs> fine. But, I mean, or maybe they don't see me because I'm, you know, I'm always sitting in my office typing away on my computer, right? They're the ones in the lab doing the hard work, coming up with the great ideas and, and making this all happen. So I thank all of them, um, but I also wanted to sincerely thank Wayne Hindmarsh. So I don't think I would be standing here today if Wayne, Wayne had not recruited me. So when I was looking at the University of Toronto, I was a little bit skeptical about joining a faculty pharmacy. I, mean, I was a chemist by training. I was coming from a chemistry department. I thought, pharmacy, I don't know what that's all about. But Wayne sat me down, and he clearly had this huge vision for where we could go here. And that's what really kind of, it, it just made me want to be a part of it. And I'm, I'm so glad that I made that decision and I, I now see the vision that he painted for me, you know, it, it is happening. We have an amazing group of people here. We have an amazing building uh, and, some, and some really wonderful programs. And so I thank Wayne for getting me here and uh, 
giving me the hard sell and getting me to take the leap and then also being a wonderful mentor and, and somebody who really helped me get my career off the ground here after I moved to Toronto. I also want to thank Leslie Dan and, and we're so um, fortunate to have him here today with us. Uh, again, without his support of our faculty and this amazing building, this program wouldn't be where it is today. I don't know that I would have attracted the, the trainees that I, I have the pleasure of working with. Um, and I really feel uh, very, very fortunate to be a part of, of this group that is all really, we can trace it back to, to Leslie Dan's very uh, generous support of our faculty. So I wanted to, to thank you two in particular. <laughs> I also just want to thank everyone at the, the faculty <laughs> club because it's a group of faculty, it's a group of colleagues, um, but there are so many people that make this place work. And it's really, I mean, I can see Tara back there, I know Franco is back there, I'm sure Titi is somewhere, I know Nina's probably running around doing whatever. Um, but it's really the, the, the people that help us just push everything forward. Um, by making this a very functional environment, and, and that support is, is absolutely essential. So at every level, I, I wanted to, to say, say thank you to the people that make this place run. And then finally, again, I thank my group. I have to thank these two people. It just, you know, I, I can't even summarize uh, how critical these two folks are. Mark Ferrer has been with me for quite some time. He's really become my right-hand person. I think sometimes people don't even bother come talking to me anymore. They just go find Mark because, like, you know, Shana might know the answer, but Mark definitely will know the answer. <laughs> and everything that we do, you know, if we didn't have a Mark there helping us get the grant proposals out or single-handedly getting grant proposals out and just making our whole operation run, we wouldn't be able to do all the science that I just told you about. Bob Christensen just joined us recently. He's our group administrator. Uh, but having somebody like Bob in this position, it's already been transformative. It's so critical. Uh, for us to have the support and, and have that uh, administrative component covered off so that we can really pay attention to the science. And then lastly, I, this is the long list of people from, that have been in the group. And these are just our postdocs and our, um, I wrote postdoc and PDF. I meant to say graduate student and, and PDF alumni. This is an amazing list of group of, uh, or a group of people that have been in the, the group over the years. I'm so proud of the folks that have gone off and, and started their own labs. I'm also incredibly proud of all the folks that we've sent into industry that are doing amazing things working in, in companies. And I think that's part of what we do here that's so important, right? We train pharmacists in this building, and that's incredibly important. But we also train a new generation of people working in the pharmaceutical industry that are getting new drugs to the clinic, right? And so I, I really... Uh, you know, when I look at this list, I look at the places that they go, I'm, I'm so proud and I'm, I'm so grateful that we've had the opportunity to train these folks so that they can really move the needle in terms of what's available to clinical medicine. So finally, and I promise this is the last uh, set of thank yous, but maybe the most important, I have to thank these people. So, whoops. <laughs> That's, wasn't supposed to be that brief. Because um, these three very handsome guys, maybe four if you count this furry uh, <laughs> police officer, um, you know, for me, being able to do everything that I do, I, I couldn't do it without these people. Um, and so, you know, I'm a busy person, I'm a busy mom, but I, I just, I, it wouldn't all work if I didn't have a wonderful family at home who are very understanding of you know, a parent who's always running around and doing a million things um, and always, always has her head in a manuscript or whatever. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. And so Connor and Owen are here with us today. Ted is on a plane coming home from Turkey, or he would be here. Um, but in any event, I, I thank them very much for all of their support and, and our, our wonderful family. So thank you. Thank you very much.